very much. Um, Cassidy has kindly agreed. We don't have a slide changer, so I'm just going to give you the nod every time, Cassidy, and we'll roll through. Um, I want to make a special thank you to Christy Oxley and Tammy Lee for all the back and forth behind the scenes. To one speaker, please get close to the mic. Yes. Thank you. I might need to uh, put this here so I can see what I'm doing. Thank you. Um, I wanted to thank Christy Oxley and Tammy Lee for all the help behind the scenes to get me here, and Jennifer Fox last night at the hotel, and Keely and Cassidy this morning to get everything going. And um, I have a real soft spot for school libraries and teacher librarians. I think that you are um, the last bastion of intellectual freedom in this country, and the work that you do is, is deeply profound, and it's a hard road, and I, I'm extreme, extremely humbled to be here to support you. Um, I wanted to say I'm going to turn the challenge accepted back to you. Hi, Richard. <laughs> um, I'm doing two other sessions today, and I don't want to talk at you for three hours. So just while you're making choices of what sessions to go through, session A, I'm going to be listening to you, and you're going to be sitting in small groups and talking about the challenges that you're facing and arriving on one or two that you want to workshop with me in session B. So I would like those of you that go to session A to also go to session B. So make that decision if you're willing to sign on for both. Because session A is to talk about your challenges and session B is to workshop them so that you leave the event today feeling like you actually have some concrete actions that you can take to improve things where you feel challenges. So that's just a heads up there. Um, can we go to the next slide? I just wanted to let you know, this is some work I did with a research assistant, Cheryl Trepanier, last spring. You may be familiar with various of the library and inf information studies indexes like library and information science, library and information science source, and Scopus. Uh, what we did was just search for uh, the root library and then the phrase human rights or social justice or social responsibility, and that was in the spring of uh, 2018. And so what you can see from this slide, um, we just started with 1973 because that is really when the social responsibility movement um, went into high gear in North America within our field. Um, there has been a, a steady rise up till about 2001, 2002, and then you can see a real spike. So this is reflecting what we're finding in our own literature. Um, so the kinds of things that I'm talking about today are lots of, uh, reflected in lots of discussions and discourses, not just here in Canada, but elsewhere too. So Cassidy, let's move to the next. I uh, did a keynote in Zadar, Croatia in June. Um, so you can see for that I included here the Balkans and the Balkan Peninsula. Um, but you can see from United States to the UK, Canada, Australia, South Africa, India, Nigeria, China, Croatia, Germany, and so on, um, that these topics are being discussed within the library community in many parts of our world. And so the work that we're talking about today, um, we have sisters all over talking about the same thing, sisters and brothers. Okay. So what does it mean to protect, enforce, and advocate for human rights in your work and in your life? What are the challenges to the implementation of a more just society that guarantees human rights for all? This was a question that was posed to all of us by the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions in The Hague, that's our big umbrella organization for our field, and they posed this question um, just about a year ago in December 2017 as they were launching a new blog called Speak Up and they were coming on to celebrate the Universal Declaration of Human Rights because, of course, uh, December 10th is always Human Rights Day. So this keynote this morning raises awareness about uh, that very topic, about human rights that relate particularly to core library values, to information ethics, and global information justice more broadly. These include, but are not limited to, such things as the freedom of thought, the freedom of religion, the freedom of opinion and expression, the right to association, 
the right to peaceful assembly, cultural rights, and the right to education. I should say that in addition to this keynote being recorded, I've also provided this PowerPoint um, to members of the executive so that you, it's, it's very dense. It's, it's, it's a mini lecture in a sense, so that will be available to you on your website so you can go back and work with it in time with your colleagues. Uh, we want to give attention to the inherent tension between intellectual freedom and social responsibility. There's always a tension there as it sits underneath many aspects of our work. And this keynote really does go to the heart of the critical question, and it's a tough question. I don't know if we would all agree on the answer. What constitutes teacher-librarian work today? So we use our education and experience in the field of librarianship to ameliorate social concerns. For example, with our library associations, we engage in law reform on copyright for people with print disabilities. In our school context, we educate people around us about how commercial internet filters often are biased against sexual and gender minorities. Broadly in society, we protect sensitive cultural heritage in the context of war, conflict, genocide, and hate. I've done some work in Sarajevo, for example, where we know over 20 years ago in the war, the National Library and Archives was firebombed deliberately as an attempt to erase the material evidence that different ethnic groups live together in peace. So later this morning, session one, um, I'll be listening to attendees about the patterns and themes in their work that they feel need work. Conversational session exploring lived challenges in our work with the intention to identify themes and patterns that may demand our collective attention both now and into the future. These may include such topics as challenges to the collections, book leveling included, internet related challenges, this may be around filtering, access to computers and use policies. Challenges to library services, this may be around displays or programs or speakers. Student or privacy confidentiality issues and hate-based group challenges, for example, damage of library property to target a specific group. Then in, uh, we want to keep in mind position statements that you have with BCTLA. These are in an effort to clarify and affirm issues considered best practices. Uh, these are written by members of your board after significant research and consultation. So we can find the book leveling and school library collection statement as well as the uh, more universal school library programs position statement. I challenge you what other statements are needed. So then in session two, we'll continue the conversation and this time to explore practical strategies for addressing the concerns raised first. This may be about educating trustees on the board, policy development, position statements that need to come forth, dialogue, empathy, collaboration, who do we need to partner with that we haven't yet, supports, funds, and otherwise, specifically for library workers like you, who go out on a limb in defense of their professional ethics, who has your back. We want to leverage your missions and goals for BCTLA, and I'll just walk you through these very quickly. I'm sure you're familiar. But these give us ideas about how to support the challenges we need to develop action for. Improving learning and working conditions is always fundamental. Providing professional development and materials, our education. Highlighting standards and practice and developing shared understandings about those. Acting as a hub for ideas, trends and innovations as this conference does today. Encouraging the development and acquisition of quality learning resources and tools. Supporting and encouraging the attainment of specialist qualifications, as many of you are in the process of doing continuously. Liaising with other associations and federations to pursue common goals, and thus I mentioned IFLA, the International Federation. Communicating with post-secondary facilities that provide teacher education. Not all of you are getting your training and education in the same places and bringing those experiences together. Proposing policy positions to the BCTF and other appropriate agencies and advocating through the BCTF for Ministry of Education support and recognition, which you've obviously done extraordinarily well. The International Center for Information Ethics, ICIE, um, which I affiliated with, we've done some work over time to identify on the website um, particular human rights that um, 
relate directly to information work and give us a basis for ethical thinking on the responsibility of information specialists such as yourselves on at least the following of the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So this is going to cue you in to actual articles of the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Of course, the first is Article 1, respect for the dignity of human beings. In multiple articles, we see attention to confidentiality. I would argue that the freedom to read only exists with the freedom to read privately. Equality of opportunity, privacy, the right to be protected from torture or cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. I would assert that many of your students find the school library space to be the safest space to explore some of the other aspects of human rights the right to own property, the right to freedom of a thought, conscience, and religion, the right to freedom of opinion and expression. And I'm focusing on 19 because many people in librarianship know about Article 19, but they don't connect 19 to other aspects of human rights that are listed here. The right to peaceful assembly and association. And um, this one I, is very, very dear to my heart, the right to economic, social, and cultural rights indispensable for dignity and the free development of personality. One of the most important things we can protect for our kids in our schools is that right to the free development of personality. And the school library space is a very important space for them to do so. Of course, the right to education the right to participate in the cultural life of the community, including the school community, the right to the protection of the moral and material interests concerning any scientific, literary, or artistic production. So, of course, we're teaching about intellectual property and copyright. Information specialists then have a moral responsibility with regard to our users at various levels, the individual level, the institutional level, your school, and the society level. From a school library perspective then, this lays a solid foundation for us to talk about helpful topics to your work, such as the library as a neutral space within the school, the library resources as a complement to the curriculum. Of course, they support the curriculum, they're intended to support the curriculum, but they may also provide a complement to the curriculum in very important ways. The need for multilingual and multi-format school library collections, which continues to be such a challenge in our country. Teacher library staff educated in the freedom to read, the freedom to view, the freedom to listen, and the freedom to play. And those are aspects of education that come directly through um, programs, diplomas, and degrees in librarianship. And if a teacher is at first thrust into the school library context, they may not have in their educational background um, the confidence to, to deal with the challenge around the freedom to view, listen, and play, and that's and a very important piece to, to build up. And of course, the library is a place to help foster diversity and inclusion, the free development of personality, and decolonization. And of course, through these aspects, we begin to see tensions where intellectual freedom and social responsibility may butt up against one another and it's ex extremely nuanced and sophisticated to tease those apart. Uh, the IFLA, again, International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, has a very helpful set of guidelines that was developed in 2015. One of the primary authors was Diane Oberg, and I know some of you studied with Diane. Um, in the Teacher Librarianship by Distance program at the University of Alberta and, and, and probably interacted with her many, many times and it's profound work and it should be directly linked to any, I believe, language and statements and positions that you're developing here in BC. And I'll walk you through some of the key recommendations because it is still quite fresh only three years ago and it's available um, in many, many languages on the IFLA website and embedded in the slide set here. The first recommendation is that the mission and purposes of the school library should be stated clearly in terms that are consistent with the principles of IFLA's UNESCO School Library Manifesto. If you haven't read that, I strongly encourage you to do so. Um, it is an ideological framing of the very reason for school libraries. 
And then we should be connecting to the values expressed in the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of the Child, as well as the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, and then finally the core values of the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. Um, these are all available full text online and connecting to these and studying these and making reference to these really helps you deal with the challenge when you get it because it helps articulate to your community that our school library hasn't gone rogue, our school isn't rogue, what we do in our school is in line what BCTLA does, is in line what BCLA does with librarianship, is in line with the Canadian Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, is in line with the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, is in line with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, is in line with the United Nations. And that immediately gives you weight in a conversation with somebody that may be questioning what you do. And they may simply not know that there is such a deeply um, a, a deep connection with breadth and depth to all of these other positions. And it will give people confidence in you as well. The second recommendation, of course, and I won't read through every line, is just to be consistent with expectations nationally, regionally, locally, and with the outcomes of your curricula. Everything should fit together. Of course, recommendation three is to have a qualified school librarian, a collection that supports the curriculum, and an explicit plan for ongoing growth and development of the school library. And of course, what we're hearing in the beautiful words about the award winners today is they're always thinking about a positive trajectory to the future. The work is ongoing, it's never done. In the fourth recommendation from IFLA, we hear about meeting the changing needs of the school community. It then goes on to address legal responsibilities, appropriate government levels to ensure uh, good work and that these responsibilities are clearly defined for the establishment, support, and continuous improvement of school libraries to be accessible to all students. That's not the case yet in Canada, and we still have work to do. Recommendation six is where we really start humming with my keynote theme today. School library legislation should be in place at an appropriate governmental level or levels to ensure that ethical responsibilities of all members of the school community are clearly defined, including such rights as equity of access, freedom of information and privacy, and of course we have legislation there, copyright and intellectual property, and children's right to know. These are all phrasings that we need to be comfortable with, we need to understand how they work together, we need to have policy to support the work that they do, because there will be questioning from within the school community and without the school community about how we work with these topics. Seventh, um, IFLA asserts the, the direct, that work should be under the direction of a professional school librarian with formal education in school librarianship and classroom teaching. And that's not to take anything away of access, right to privacy, and the right to know for all of your library users. We are told to um, think about the school's curriculum in relationship to the national, ethnic, and cultural identities and members of the school community, and to increase access to those through a variety of measures, not just through collections, but also cataloging, curation, and resource sharing. And we are prompted to think about facilities, equipment, collections, and services that evolve and change. We're prompted to think about uh, connections. Um, we'll go on to number 12, Cassidy. Connections among school libraries and with public libraries and academic libraries. And um, so for those of you that may have crossed over from teaching to the school library context, um, the onus is on you to build those relationships through your networks with the public libraries around you as well as um, colleges and universities with a shared commitment towards access to information and lifelong learning. Recommendation 14 is very important. 
It highlights that services and programs provided through the school library should be developed collaboratively by a professional school librarian working in concert with the principal, curriculum leaders, teaching colleagues, members of other groups, members of cultural, linguistic, indigenous and other unique populations to contribute to the achievement of the academic, cultural and social goals of the school. The work should be evidence-based, drawing on data, always striving for improvement. There should be systematic communication of the work, of course, with stakeholders and decision makers. And next slide, please, Cassidy. So this work will bring challenge because not everybody's comfortable with kids having access to information. Not everybody's comfortable with kids having access to privacy. <laughs> not everybody's comfortable with all of the cultural um, features of all of our kids and so forth. Challenges can be informal, simply inviting an educational conversation, or they may be formal, requiring specific policy and specific process. And it's very easy to feel stressed by perceived conflict. If you're sitting here today and you're thinking, well, we haven't had any challenges in my school library, so we're good, you should be worried. <laughs> Because that tells me that there's unconscious inside censorship and self-censorship going on. If there's nothing in your collection that's making someone uncomfortable, your collection would be too safe. If nobody's questioning any of your policies, that means they're not taking an interest or your policies aren't pushing into the future. So I would task yourself you never believe your own press. <laughs> Just because there aren't challenges doesn't mean the work is done. If you're getting challenges, that's a good thing. That means you're pushing the envelope. People are taking an interest. The conversations are starting. So it's almost counterintuitive to flip, but there's a very famous expression that um, there should be something in your library <laughs> um, that offends somebody. And if that's not the case, your work, your work is too safe. So um, we all have unconscious biases as well as conscious biases. So I, that's why we need to work in concert with community and people from different cultures and approaches to collections and resources and services because we have biases and we have blind spots. Um, I would say this having been on the National Academic Freedom Committee for six years, a few years back for the Canadian Association of University Teachers, sometimes we'll go to an institution and they'll say, well, we haven't had any academic freedom challenges. Well, the only time that ever happens is when people self-select into that institution and that institution self-selects people who will work there. And so that may, for example, be a faith-based institution where there's, in a sense, some kind of loyalty oath that you're, you're adhering to before you go in or before you're brought in. In that, in that case, there may be no challenges, but that doesn't necessarily mean um, it's respecting academic freedom. So um, this is intended to help us build up our confidence with challenge work so that we successfully and comfortably serve in our roles rather than work reactively with defensiveness or fear. The elephant in the room, I would say, is always self-censorship and inside censorship. I would guess that many of you here have done a little bit of work under the radar, off the record, <laughs> maybe to get a book into your collection, or maybe not to have a catalog, just so the kids have access to it, signaling that you're not sure necessarily how to do it above board through the system without getting into trouble. Um, so this is ongoing work. We do not operate in a professional vacuum, and this fact alone adds weight to our work. Librarianship has adopted, as I've said, an established professional ethos of ethics of values which wind from the international level to the national level, to the provincial level at BCLA, of course, and then in TL context, also from IFLA's school library guidelines down to the work of BCTLA. This is your first point of communication when you're pushing the envelope on your work. There's a whole international community standing alongside of you. And IFLA goes back to 1927. So the aspirational vision, of course, is something that we strive for in our umbrella rhetoric. And on the ground at the institutional level, there will be difference in nuance in policy and practice. So from school to school, from district to district, and as we move out of BC across the country and beyond that, uh, policies and positions might look slightly different. And, and that's okay, because they're reflecting the community. 
And of course, this rhetoric is illuminated by the IFLA Code of Ethics for librarians and other information workers, which is still relatively new and emerged in the August of 2012. And I would encourage you to go through that on your own time. I won't address all of it today, but uh, just for you to know, it has a number of sections beyond the preamble. One is about access to information. All of you are engaged in that. Secondly, responsibilities towards individuals in society. You're all engaged in that. Thirdly, privacy, secrecy, and transparency. You're all engaged in that. Open access and intellectual property. There's a lot of movement in the educational sector about open access, and of course, we all have to adhere to intellectual property legislation. Neutrality, personal integrity, and professional skills. And then colleague and employer-employee relationship is always important. So um, it's important to acknowledge that the Code of Ethics and Professional Conduct is offered at a, as a series of ethical propositions by IFLA to guide us and for the consideration of other associations, which could, for example, be BCTLA, when creating or revising their own codes. And of course, the function of Codes of Ethics are to encourage reflection on principles on which librarians and other info workers can form policies and handle dilemmas to improve professional self-awareness and to provide transparency to users and society in general. So connecting our ethical um, responsibilities beyond our own district and all the way up to the international level is really important. The code is offered in the belief that librarianship is in its very essence an ethical activity embodying a value-rich approach to professional work with information. There's nothing more political than working with information. It's really, really hard work and it's not an accident, I think, that it's done. It's a feminized profession, which doesn't automatically mean it's a feminist profession, but it's feminized with a majority of women workers who are pushing for free access to information and the sharing of information. And this goes in the face of a lot of the prevailing ideology in society today. And um, when there's war and conflict, there's also censorship. So we can see um, what's happening in the journalism community is um, something we should always pay attention to. Journalism is a sister profession to librarianship. Journalists like us believe in informed citizenry, the Jeffersonian principle of educating ourselves, educating ourselves to vote with informed opinion and access to information. And when um, there's repression in societies, journalists suffer. And when journalists suffer, librarians suffer. So we want to think about who our sister professionals are. And there's, in recent years, there's never been more killings of journalists than now. So the need to share ideas and information has grown more important with the increasing complexity of society in recent centuries, and this provides a rationale for our work. And the role of information institutions such as school libraries um, in modern society is to support the optimization of the recording and representation of information and to provide access to it. Information service is in the interest of social, cultural, and economic well-being. <coughs> Ultimately, we're striving for peace and well-being. So not access to information just for a democratic purpose. Why do democracies exist? We're striving for peace and well-being. And that's at the heart of librarianship, and therefore librarians do have social responsibility. <clears throat> Furthermore, IFLA asserts this belief in the human necessity of sharing information and ideas implies the recognition of information rights. The right to know. The child's right to know. The girl child's right to know. You can't really have a right to education these days if you don't have a right to information. Many people consider access to the internet a human right now. They consider the internet a utility. So the idea of the right to education in the present day is increasingly connected with the right to information and to access information. And that's exactly the work that you're doing. And these ideas of human rights, particularly as expressed by the UN, require us all to recognize and acknowledge the humanity of others and their respect to rights. And in particular, our field acknowledges Article 19, which sets out the freedom of opinion, expression, and access to information for all human beings. 
regardless of frontiers. And this provides a rationale for libraries in the practice of modern and progressive librarianship. IFLA in statements, manifestos, and policy and technical documents too numerous to list has expanded this understanding. And implicit in this work is the idea of information rights and their significance for the profession and society more generally. The emphasis on information rights in turns obliges librarians and other info workers to develop a principled critique of relevant law and to be prepared to advise and, if appropriate, to advocate the improvement of both the substance and administration of laws. Uh, the Canadian library community, for example, has been exceedingly successful at advocating for law reform about copyright in the digital era. So I would just encourage you on your own time to go and look at IFLA's Code of Ethics for Library and Other Information Workers because it will really help you understand um, that ideological, philosophical foundation for the work and how it relates to human rights and information rights. We also have umbrella national rhetoric and this is reflected in the Canadian Federation of Library Associations and Institutions um, and it's um, very much built on this foundation of intellectual freedom. And the CFLA recognizes and values the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. That's really important for you to see. If you haven't looked at the C CFLA, of course, uh, is the successor to the former Canadian Library Association a few years ago. And it's very important for you to see that the policy set at CFLA sits on the foundational policy of intellectual freedom. And that foundational policy in its first sentence directly speaks to the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So teacher librarianship work is human rights work. And the guarantor of the fundamental freedoms in Canada of conscience and religion, of thought, belief, opinion and expression, of peaceful assembly and association, these are all the things that are fostered in the school library. The CFLA supports and promotes the universal principles of intellectual freedom as defined in the UN Declaration. So in, in our National Library Association statement, we see reference to the Canadian Charter, we see reference to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the interlocking freedoms to hold opinions and ideas. And in accordance with these principles, the CFLA affirms that all persons in Canada, and I've put that in red on the slide, because that is not limited to Canadian citizens. That's a very specific phrasing that all persons in Canada, whether a citizen, whether a permanent resident, whether a temporary foreign worker, whether a visitor, as you move through, as you stay, you are a person in Canada have the fundamental right subject only to the Constitution and the law, to have access to the full range of knowledge, imagination, ideas, and opinions, and to express their thoughts publicly. Only the courts may abridge free expression rights in Canada. Often what happens when we're concerned about people above us and around us that control our collective agreements and control the money pots and control whether or not we, um, our contract is renewed, um, we know where the line is, where we have the right to work to. We know where the law is, and we have the right to go all the way to the law, but we often stop before that. And that's where I challenge all of us, to work all the way to the line, and then when we get to the line, if there needs to be law reform, let's engage in law reform. So if the line is 10 feet away, let's not stop at foot six and foot seven. Let's go all the way to the 10 feet, and then when we're at, that line, let's engage in law reform, otherwise we will never realize our aims. So for accountability, you can again go on the CFLA website and take a look at their rhetoric, but just to know, like the others, it connects to human rights and to the international context. And to be accountable to these, you really have to know your policies. The best way to know your policy is to be in the development of policy yourself to know your processes, the best way to know that is to be doing it, and to know where you fit in in any given process and where you pass the work up the line. <coughs> Do you have the right to speak to the media? If the media calls upon your school, if there's a conflict or a challenge, um, do you know who to direct that to, who does the speaking? Identify where the policy development needs to occur, and then learn up in advance so that when a question or challenge arrives, you know what to do. This could be concerning a challenge to an individual item in your collection. It could be a book. It could be a song. 
It could be your school's newspaper. School newspapers have been challenged before. Um, it could be a video. It could be a whole genre. For example, graphic novels. Or in the public library environment, a whole genre that's sometimes challenged is video games. It could be an entire policy. It could be your internet access policy. It could be your speaker policy, your meeting room policy, your rental policy, um, and any individual that's using the library space. It could be a challenge to a display. It could be a challenge to a rainbow display. It could be a challenge about somebody believes this work is fiction and another person believes this work is nonfiction and how do you manage that? It could be about the cataloging and the subject access. We want to have empathy and understand that this is not an us versus them scenario when we're standing up for information rights and human rights. So most so-called censors are well-intentioned people. They are trying to protect someone or some group of people. They are taking, in their mind, a position of social responsibility, and we do have to respect that, even if we don't agree with it. And that should be acknowledged always. We do not want to alienate people and opportunities for education about the important work that we do. People have a right to question us. We have to have accountability. We have the responsibility to invite the questioning, to listen, and of course then to respond professionally. I would rather you had challenges to the work that you do and you talked about those challenges and you worked through those challenges than to have no challenges at all because to have ch no challenges at all means people have stopped paying attention and that threatens the role and the work of what constitutes teacher librarianship. So accountability continued. We may make no change due to a challenge to what we do but we will articulate why. However, we may adjust something we do, for example, by moving a book classification from child to young adult because we see we made a mistake. We may need to consult legal counsel to determine if something we do is crossing a line or simply perceived to be crossing a line. And there is a big difference. We need to understand the criminal code. We need to know what is the legal definition of hate speech. We need to know what is the legal definition of obscenity. Because somebody says that's pornographic doesn't actually mean, it <laughs> means that it meets a legal definition of obscenity. It may be something that offends somebody, that they've loosely labeled pornographic or obscene. Um, so again, legal definitions are extremely important. And what is crossing a legal line versus perception of crossing a legal line are two different things. Your job, based on the international rhetoric of our field, is to go all the way to the line. We welcome, invite, and encourage dialogue. Again, we want people to notice and care about what we do. So I would encourage that we don't dread or question a challenge. We embrace the work as part of our normal job, not just here in BC, but alongside our sister libraries near and far. And of course, we're stronger when we all do it together. Uh, I do need to ask, to what extent is there impunity for in teacher librarians? Is there exemption from punishment or freedom from the injurious consequence of an action? If there are no challenges in your library, it's probably because you're self-censoring, because you're afraid. You're afraid because you don't know who's going to have your back if you go out on a limb in the defense of intellectual freedom and social responsibility. So we have to ask, I know there are many in this room who are the courageous teacher librarians throughout BC who have taken personal and professional risk, those are two different kinds of risks, although they do go together, to push for social change. These are people who may never be compensated for their good fights or worse, may suffer loss because of them, yet continue to choose compassion and conviction over complacency in their work. How can we honor those people that go out on the limb? Um, you may know that in 2016, the then Canadian Library Association announced that Richard Beaudry, who's here, and Gail, is Gail here? No, no. Gail Chaddock Costello were chosen as winners of that year's award for the advancement of intellectual freedom in Canada for their demonstrated leadership and exceptional courage in resisting censorship and opposing violations of intellectual freedom in school libraries and schools. 
Mr. Beaudry, longtime teacher librarian in BC and first VP then of the Langley Teachers Association, and Ms. Chadda Costello, then the association's president, were involved in a series of formal grievances in different schools over an extended period of time against arbitrary policies and decisions that would have severely restricted access to reading materials for students and in some cases teachers as well. I'm reading from the Canadian Library Association press release in 2016. Although the results of their principal determination to support intellectual freedom principles in a school environment are felt most directly by the local students and teaching staff, the courage of these two in opposing school library censorship will serve as a model for all Canadians faced with the evolving crisis, which you know well in BC, in school library services. Mr. Brodery has said, if you attack one library in Canada, you attack them all. And it is his and Ms. Chatta Costello's commitment to the broader national perspective that is also recognized in this award. And we can send, extend that to the international perspective. Mr. Beaudry and Ms. Chatta Costello have not only defined the rights, and we're going back to that word rights, human rights, information rights, educational rights, defended the rights of students and teachers to intellectual freedom in a local school district in one province. They've also added significantly to the national narrative that sees these and related rights and responsibilities as imperative and, and immutable in all school libraries across Canada. One of CLA's core beliefs is that the principles of intellectual freedom and unfettered universal access to information through libraries are key components of an open and democratic society. In the face of significant opposition, these two individuals have demonstrated an unvarying dedication to the preservation and enhancement of the school library access and services across the aggrieved school district. This award recognizes and supports their principled collective achievements in championing school library reading, unfettered access to library materials, the importance of school board policies, honoring due process. Due process is so important. And the core value of intellectual freedom. This was a case that we will continue to return to that I teach all the time in my work at the University of Alberta and um, it is a milestone case not only in Canada but internationally and it came out of BC and I congratulate Richard and all of you. As we all um, work through the media each day, whether it's in print or online, TV, radio, however we do it, um, I do want to extend this discussion and the kind of award-winning work that's come out of BC to this continuum of risk to impunity. Because we know that there's unemployment, we know that there's underemployment. We know there are many undocumented channel cha challenges in libraries in Canada school libraries, public libraries, and so forth. Many challenges happen, they're never documented. How do we know? How do we track them? Why aren't they documented? Is there a process for documentation? Is there a process for dealing with them? Um, dismissals, omissions, concessions, negations, racializations, suspicions, and more broadly in global society and expressive freedom labor, and we do work in expressive freedom labor, we must be concerned with detainments and missings. People go to a conference and they never come home. Journalists writes a story and we never see them again. This is inextricably linked to the work that is done in schools, particularly in school libraries, around access to information, and it is inextricably linked to human rights because of the reality that as many human rights rhetorical statements as we have in society, they are violated every single day, everywhere, including here in Canada. So, themes and patterns that we'll return to in sessions A and B, if you choose to come, um, I'll just remind you, maybe challenges to collections, such as the book leveling that, that Richard and Gail worked on. They may be around filters in our school systems or access to computers and use policies. Challenges to services, displays, programming, speakers, privacy or confidential, confidentiality issues, and 
hate-based crime, which could be damage of library property to target a specific group. And by the way, these examples are informed by the American Library Association's work, and they are the oldest and largest library association in the world going back to 1876. They know a lot about challenges. Um, and then practical strategies, I've added a few from when I brought this up about 20 minutes ago. So I've mentioned we may want to do further work educating our trustees. For example, ALA, the American Library Association, does webinars on intellectual freedom for trustees. Policy development, dialogue, empathy, collaboration, support funds for library workers who do. Is there an intellectual freedom defense fund here in BC with BCTLA? What about workplace speech? How does we speak up? And of course, whistleblowing. Whistleblowing is a topic of discussion across labor sectors across the world. And uh, protection of library and information workers on the ground, even from oppression within their own institutional culture in just about any part of the world remains underappreciated as a threat to the global information profession's ability to support human rights. I've said many times in my writings and talks over the last 25, 30 years that uh, the greatest threat to intellectual freedom in Canada is the Canadian school library crisis. That's where it starts, and that's where it stops. And with the rise of social media policies, codes of conduct, civility and behavior codes, we must be mindful of fundamental tensions between equity, diversity, and intellectual freedom as they play out in our profession. I don't always assume a behavior code is a good thing. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Um, and just to bring you back to the opening, um, IFLA did um, invite comment on librarianship and human rights. Um, and this is happening in many parts of the world. I had a piece published in March 2018 in the uh, Turkish Librarianship Journal, uh, entitled Reflection on Risk in the Endeavors of Librarianship and Human Rights. I'm told I don't know, I've been published in Turkey before in Turkish translation, and I don't know if it's true, I have been told that um, some of my writings translated in Turkey are the first to evidence in writing the, using, linking the words librarianship and human rights. That's not, if that is the case, it's not because our colleagues in the Turkish library community don't know what we do. But sometimes you have to invite an external person to validate what the inside workers know and have been saying for a long time but don't feel safe expressing. So on one hand, it's nice to be published in another country on librarianship and human rights. On another hand, it makes me really sad because they already have this figured out, but it's safer for them to have me say it in writing than for them, and we really need to pay attention to that. Um, and then again, as I said a year ago in December, IFLA invited comment on the connection between librarianship and human rights for their new Speak Up blog, and I did contribute to the first entry to that blog, and I'll just share a little with you about what I said, and then I'll wind it down. And I mentioned that IFLA's 2012 Code of Ethics um, as very important, because it's not uncommon to find evidence in our work of um, critical library services in the interest of human rights, civil liberties, and social justice. And you may not be aware um, that IFLA acknowledged the precarious roles of its work, dated that the president of IFLA, when informed of such cases after due consideration, intervened when appropriate with competent authorities on behalf of these colleagues. There are librarians that um, endure house arrest, for example, in other parts of the world simply for giving access to kids in school library collections. And then in 1989, at the IFLA Council meeting in Paris, it recalled this 1983 Munich Resolution and put forth a new statement called the Resolution on the Freedom of Expression, Censorship, and Libraries. And it was not until IFLA introduced its Code of Ethics in 2012, though, that the association offered specialized clauses on workplace speech and on whistleblowing. So IFLA formed in 1927, and we get all the way up till 2012 to actually get to the heart of workplace speech and whistleblowing. And the code also acknowledges that IFLA has no enforcement authority over any library administration, nor do the vast majority of library associations around the world. So this is the tricky part. IFLA can't tell 
any library or school library administration in BC what to do. It can only work with persuasion and consensus building. It has no enforcement authority. Labor law will trump. Collective agreements will trump. And of course, actualization of any code depends on multiple and shifting conditions. Employment terms in any given library administration and school, labor law and related legislation in any given legal jurisdiction, influence and consensus making within the library and information community, which we can build here and society, individual conflicting commitments to ourselves, to our profession, to our employer, to our community, and to the law. And it's uh, not easy to reconcile these different considerations. And there's clear evidence that working librarians at times have lost out in the process. I did want you to know in the American context that the ALA uh, has a resolution on workplace speech from 2005, but because um, it's not enforceable, they also have the Leroy C. Merritt Humanitarian Fund to provide financial assistance for librarians who have been discriminated against or denied employment rights because of the defense of intellectual freedom, including freedom of speech. I think we need to build up similar uh, protections in Canada. And I think I'll skip over a few. Well, no, I'll go back. Can you go forward, Cassidy, just a um, couple more, a couple more. I did want to just say a number of years ago, I led a group in the Association for Library and Information Science Education to develop a position statement on information ethics, which would assert that we should all teach and learn about information ethics in our field, and it was adopted unanimously in 2008. It was held back a year, Cassidy. Um, and so this is probably something you can all relate to. It was held back a year and had to get a parliamentarian judgment on should versus the word could in the statement. So let's not kid ourselves about how hard it is to do position development work. And we can lose a year to a parliamentarian who is helping two camps of people choose between the word should and the verse could. And this is the reality that we all live with. I wrote an article about it called, I guess we'll just have to wait for the movie to come out. Um, but if you can go to the next slide, Cassidy, I did want to share with you something I think that you all know, that procedural concerns often trump positions. How sound are policies and procedures? As aspirational statements are worthwhile, but often in the breach. We have human rights statements, they're violated every day. We're striving for a new policy to support the fine work that we do, but the procedural should versus could will hang us up for a year or two years or cause us to walk away. And how can we build up our skill set there? Um, I'm just gonna close here. Um, as we work in sessions A and B, if you choose to later today, I'm going to highlight out of the 10 mission and goals outlined by your BCTLA, I think there are two that um, to me stand out as conditional to the others. One, improving learning and working conditions. And then on the next slide, proposing policy positions to the BCTF and other appropriate agencies. When I look at the BC TLA website, I only see two position statements, one on book leveling and one the more universal, you know, statement about school library programs. I think to push your work further on the thin edge of the wedge on librarianship and human rights, uh, it would be helpful to develop a set of position statements. The, the, the leveling one came out of a case. Let's not wait till there's a case for the next one. Let's get ahead of it and do it now. Thank you so much for your patience and I look forward to seeing you later. So we have a number of things we're going to talk about um, before we go, but I'd like to say a big thank you to Tony for this. Um, the time that I had with her showed me that she was a person that the, it doesn't matter if the glass is half, half full or half empty, whatever it is, as long as there's something in it, it's worth working for. It's a good thing. And to thank you for showing us that and we need to keep track of those challenges and not be scared by them, but embrace them and see them as a learning opportunity. I know my reading list has gone way up of things that I want to look up on the internet. So thank you very much again.
So we have a few housekeeping items. We need to understand how they work together. We need to have policy to support the work that they do because there will be questioning from within the school community and without the school community about how we work with these topics. Seventh, um, IFLA asserts the, the direct, that work should be under the direction of a professional school librarian with formal education in school librarianship and classroom teaching. And that's not to take anything away um, from volunteers and other people who do fine work within the school library community, but as with any other profession, um, the idea is that we have a set of foundational education and ongoing educational commitments that help, help us keep on the right side of the law in our work. And we will be devalued without it in society. Um, I'll go on and just tap into recommendation nine. Again, reinforces the importance of library policies. And um, you need to go back to your schools and your association and figure out where do we need to have uh, more of an ethos of policy development after today, I would say, including those related to equity of access, right to privacy, and the right to know for all of your library users. We are told to um, think about the school's curriculum in relationship to the national, ethnic, and cultural identities and members of the school community and to increase access